Hello and welcome to this video on the biological approach to psychology. Um, like the rest of my videos, this is targeted mainly at the AQA A-level specification, although it should be relevant for all the other A-level specification and as well as just general interest in psychology. Um, it's quite important for this one actually that I tell you that it's targeted towards the, the AQA spec because the way that it's assessed is a bit different to the rest of the approaches. Um, at AS, it's actually, there's more to it than will be in this video. There's actually a biopsychology section um, at both AS and A2, but at AS specifically, there's no biopsychology bio section on the exam. It's examined within the approaches topic. So actually, you'll need more than is in this video. You'd need some of your biopsychology information um, to, to be able to answer the questions at, at AS. So I'll either make some, some separate videos for that, or you, you can look at the, the textbook. At A2, this video will actually be enough, strangely, because actually, um, in the approaches topic, you only need to kind of know what's here, but the biopsychology, there's a lot more of it, and so it gets its own section. So it's best off to treat biopsychology as kind of a bit of a separate topic, which it is, um, and I will just cover the approaches side of um, the biological approach here. So a good place to start, obviously, looking at the spec here. So what you need to know in terms of uh, the biological approach to psychology rather than the separate biopsychology section. It's all a bit confusing, I know, but you'll get your head around it. Um, and it's this bullet point here, the third one down. So the biological approach, you need to know about the influence of genes, biological structures and neurochemistry on behaviour. You need to know about genotypes and phenotypes, uh, the genetic basis for behaviour, evolution uh, and behaviour. And so that's what I'm mainly going to be focusing on here. So just be warned if you just watch this you won't have enough information um, to answer um, the biological approach in psychology section at AS um, or the whole obviously biopsychology section at A2 um, you will need that extra information okay so um, as I said that those are the so I'm going to focus on those terms that, that, that are there in terms of um, the biological approach to psychology is very much Focus around the approaches, um, and so it's these terms here. So I'm going to go over these terms um, and give you a bit of information. We'll still evaluate it as though it was a, a normal approach, um, and then you'll need that extra information afterwards. Um, and if you look at some um, sample exam or past exam questions, you will see that you, you will need a bit more information in terms of neurons and things like that. But I'll highlight that a bit later on. Okay, so starting at genes then, good place to start with the biological approach to psychology. Um, and genes become quite important. So obviously taking a biological approach to psychology, it's different to the other approaches as you'd expect. So you hopefully have already looked at the, the behavioural approach where we look at people's behaviours, how we might have learnt those from our environment. You might have looked at the cognitive approach, which looks at thinking processes. Um, and that's all trying to explain human behaviour, why we act how we act, and human thinking, why we, why we think how we think. So actually taking a biological approach to that, you're saying, well, okay, the reason that we might be acting the way we act or, or thinking the way we think isn't actually to do with what we've learned or, or necessarily the way we're thinking, but it's more to do with what's biologically maybe programmed into us. So one way of looking at that is genes. Okay, so you're common ways to look at um, bio or psychology from a biological point of view is genetic factors that may influence our behavior. So that's inheritance. Does it come from family? Do family studies? Um, you can compare family studies to adoption studies or obviously um, families grow up in a similar environment. Um, the, those that are adopted and until they're adopted, obviously, that might be a bit of a different environment. Twin studies are really interesting as well. And the reason that twin studies can tell us a lot um, is potentially the difference between identical and non-identical non twins. So identical twins are known as monozygotic. Um, mono meaning single, one zygote, one egg. So they share 100% of their DNA compared to dizygotic twins. Um, so sharing, having two eggs um, and... What you'd expect to find if, if biology plays a role in, in anything that you're trying to explain, we, let's take OCD, for example. That's quite a common one that we, we look at biological factors. So if we're saying, right, um, OCD is caused by genes, it's caused by uh, some sort of biological 
um, component. Well, you might look at twin studies, and, and that's exactly what they do. And you would say, well, if one twin has OCD, what's the chance that the other twin has OCD? Okay, and if there is a biological underpinning there, you would expect that identical twins, monozygotic twins, would have a higher rate of OCD, a higher overlap compared to non-identical twins, because if their genes are more similar, if there's more biology um, involved, then you'd expect to find that. And that's what they actually find. There's about an 87, one study found an 87% concordance rate um, with monozygotic twins and a 47% concordance rate with dizygotic twins. I use the term there, concordance rate, and that's quite important when looking at twin studies. Um, and what a concordance rate is, is the probability of both twins, both pairs, or both pair of the twins, both in the pair of twins, that's what I meant to say, having a trait if the other does. Okay, and if the concordance rate is higher, especially compare if you compare dizygotic and monozygotic twins, and it's higher in the, the monozygotic, you can suggest that biology has a role to play. And so what you should start getting now, if you have looked at a couple of the other approaches, it's very, very difficult to, to have one clear explanation on, on, on any given thing, say it is OCD for example, there are lots of things going on there, so there might be the behaviours going on, they might have learnt it from the environment, there might may be different thinking patterns, there may be genes involved, and so it's it's not, you know, black and white, this is what's causing that, there, there tends to be a bit of overlap and, and lots of different explanations, um, and and that's a good kind of, good place to, to come from within psychology, is looking at these different explanations. The next terms you need to know about for the biological approach are genotype and phenotype. A genotype is a set of genes. We've all got a genotype um, and it is your particular genetic makeup. Um, so the genotype of identical twins would be the same. So it's the, it's the DNA, it's the biology um, that goes behind it. The phenotype is the expression of those genes um, and so for identical twins that can be different so it, it has to do with um, biological characteristics uh, the environment so how your genes are expressed that is an interaction between the genotype uh, and the environment uh, and that pretty much sum, sums it up yet yeah, so phenotype the characteristics displayed as an interaction between the expression of the genotype and the environment. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, the next thing that the biological approach takes into account, and this is sometimes often forgotten, evolution, the theory of evolution, is a biological approach. It, it comes from the idea, of, hopefully you're aware of some of these terms anyway, but of natural selection, uh, survival of the fittest, adaption. So the idea being that um, if you develop characteristics that allow you to survive in your environment, um, they will then be passed on. Um, and so we are a product of uh, people's or ancestors who have had particular characteristics that have allowed them to survive, such as walking upright. So uh, as a human, um, we have developed our over evolution uh, because that would have been an adaptive advantage. Those um, humans that didn't walk upright, or they obviously wouldn't have been humans at the time, but um, our evolutionary ancestors, they would have died off. They wouldn't have had that advantage. So we are where we are now. We have what we have now because at some point in our evolutionary past, it would have provided an adaptive advantage. Now you can apply that same thinking to psychology, to our behavior, to our thinking. So the idea is that we act how we act now because at some point in our evolutionary past it would have provided an adaptive advantage. And then you can apply that to, to numerous other things within psychology. So uh, relationships, for example, we, we apply the, the theory of attraction, what we're currently attracted to, that would have had an adaptive advantage. You could also apply it to mental health disorders. So you can suggest that, well, maybe there would have been an adaptive advantage in having particular mental health disorders sounds a bit um, strange at the moment, but yeah, for example, anorexia, there, there's an evolutionary theory of anorexia saying that actually during evolutionary times, 
um, it would have been a good thing to be able to kind of survive on very little food. And so actually the, the reason we have anorexia as a disorder is because that's been brought forward because actually that would have at, at some point provided an adaptive advantage. So that's how evolution comes in to psychology. And yeah, you need to know these terms, adaption, um, inherited characteristics, obviously passed down through, through generations, natural selection. So it suggests that those things that are beneficial survive and are passed on. Those things that aren't beneficial um, won't, won't get selected and passed on. And obviously survival of the fittest which, which encompasses all of those um, different things. So evolution is, is another key point um, in uh, biological approach to psychology. The final thing we'll look at before obviously you go on to looking at biopsychology in its own right um, is looking at biological structures and they again form part of the biological approach in psychology and they're quite important as hopefully you'll see. So we look at neurochemistry um, and that's kind of chemicals, neurotransmitters, um, so we're looking obviously at the brain because we're talking about human thinking, human behaviour, mostly comes from the brain and these neurochemicals and neurotransmitters are a really good way to look at some ways of thinking and behaving. Um, you, you take particular disorders, um, for example, so for depression, you might look at the, the neurochemicals that are involved in that um, and what happens when you start looking at that is if you can explain it on a, a chemical level, that is then where drug treatments for um, mental health disorders come from. Um, and obviously they are very popular. Now you'll, you'll go into and you'll look at it in much more detail when you look at the approaches topic, when you actually look at mental health disorders, you look at again, as I say, in this biopsychology topic, um, there is an issue there when it comes to, well, actually are you treating the underlying cause or are you just treating the, the symptoms that are there. So yeah, neurochemistry is, a, is another important area of the, the biological approach. Um, and as well as that, there's a term you need to know, which is biological structures. And so this is all the different kind of um, biological elements coming together. When we talk about biological structures, um, we talk about, you know, a group of neurons make the brain or make a particular area of the brain. So that's what, what, what we're referring to if we mention biological structures. These next three parts are important in the biological approach, um, but as I said, you will need to look in biopsychology. So you might get questions on fight or flight, sensory, relay, motor neurons, axons, um, and the somatic nervous system, sympathetic nervous system, endocrine system, etc. You you may get questions on that. In fact, I have seen them in, in sample papers uh, at AS level. Um, but I'm not, as I've already said at the start of this video, I'm not actually going to cover that now. I'm going to treat that as a separate topic in the, the biopsychology. But that's just... Uh, as, a, as a bit of a heads up that those are some of the things that you may need to look at. Okay, so finally we just need to evaluate the biological approach and as I said in my last video, you'll start noticing similar evaluative points that are coming up um, but you need to apply them to the particular um, approach. So, strengths. We've mentioned both of these strengths before if you have watched my other videos. So the fact that it's a scientific method, that's a strength of an approach, and the fact that it has applications. But what does that actually mean for the, the biological approach? Well, if we go back to the scientific method, it, the biological approach probably is the most, one of the most, if not the most, scientific methods within psychology. We're borrowing from one of the, in commas, natural sciences from biology, um, which means that any theory, any hypothesis that you have from a biological point of view, really, really easy to test. You've got replication, you've got um, falsifiability, um, and obviously in particular, if we're talking about uh, the brain, you've got scan, brain scans there being used more and more in psychology now. fMRI, MRI, CT, EEG, they're all ways of, of measuring the brain. And so the fact that this approach can really use the scientific method, in particular those sorts of methods, um, that adds a lot of weight to the approach. It's not just what we think is happening. Look, we can, we can provide some data here for that. 
The second point is applications, so real world applications. That's another good AO3 uh, strength. And obviously, we, I've mentioned it before, but it's these drug treatments. So if you take a biological view of human behavior and human thinking, that then means that we can do something about that biology, so especially if it's neurotransmitters that are potentially to blame for, for a particular way of thinking, especially if that's um, not a productive way of thinking in the case of mental health problems. Um, and again, you should be, when you actually end up coming to, to, to being examined on the approach topic, you should be borrowing um, information you get from across the course, especially at the end of year two. Um, and so you should, you will look at um, psychopathology, mental health problems, and within that you will look at treatments for particular drugs. That adds to the biological approach, okay? Um, and so, yeah, it, it will become more apparent that this approaches unit is meant to be synoptic. It shows you across the psychology um, spec and information across there, and you need to be borrowing from it, and, and good students pr producing good answers will. But for now, if this is the first thing you're looking at, just have that in mind and then revisit it when it comes to revision. Uh, and then finally, weaknesses. Um, so... The, there is, I've just said it's scientific, but actually you could suggest that there are parts of the biological approach that might not be as scientific. So there, this term unfalsifiable, there's no way to prove whether the theory is correct or not. And with the biological approach, that comes in the form of evolution. So, you know, the theory of evolution is, is a well-regarded, well-held theory. There is support, but actually there's no way of actually testing whether the the theories that come from that, saying that the reason we act how we act is from a evolutionary point of view, that it provided an evolutionary advantage, there's no way of knowing that. There's no way to go back and actually test whether these things that we are saying are beneficial were actually beneficial and led to adaption, survival of the fittest, etc. So that specific part of the biological approach um, can potentially be seen as unfalsifiable. And you need to make that clear if you're... you're um, writing this as an answer, an evaluation of the biological approach, and you just say, oh, the biological approach is unfalsifiable, that's actually quite a poor answer. You need to say why uh, and actually specifically relate it back. And then finally, um, again, this argument's come up if you've looked at the other approaches, and at year two you have issues and debates, and it will come up again, but this whole free will determinism debate. Um, so obviously free will suggests that we've got the ability to kind of choose our actions, choose our destiny, um, that the, the we've got influence over our lives. Determinism says the other way, so it says actually things are pre-programmed, predetermined. The biological approach can potentially be seen as deterministic, uh, and that means that, yeah, you, you, you're born the way you are, and so you're going to act a particular way regardless. So, for example, the testosterone approach in aggression. It says that those with higher testosterone, they're the ones that end up being more aggressive. Um, and so if that is the only explanation, it's just higher testosterone, then really you can't blame people for being aggressive because it's part of their, their biology. Um, and so that has implications as well. For, so, okay, if someone beats someone up, can you actually then arrest them if it was part of their uh, biology? Or the other way around, if you test someone as having high testosterone, do you arrest them before they've committed a crime, saying that they're going to commit one? So that is a big philosophical debate, essentially, this free will versus determinism. And the, the biological approach does swing more towards the deterministic side of the debate. OK, well, that's it for now. Um, please do make sure that, obviously, you look at the biopsychology side of things. You probably won't be able to answer um, in great enough detail um, questions on sample papers and past papers if you just use this but this is a good starting point for looking at the approaches topic uh, and yeah as I said before refer back to it once you've you've looked at some of the other topics okay thank you very much and until next time see you later